platform. So today's topic, let's get started with this. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, adversarial attacks on AI systems. So we will first, let's look at the motivation. Uh, until a few years ago, machine learning algorithms simply did not work very well on many, on many meaningful tasks like image recognition or language translation and so on. So when a machine learning algorithm failed to do the right thing, it was the rule rather than the exception, right? Uh, however, today, uh, we know that machine learning algorithms have advanced to the next stage of development. That is like when we present them with naturally occurring inputs, they can outperform humans. So, but we know that machine learning has not yet reached true human level performance because when confronted by even like a trivial adversary or a more like a, uh, what we are going to look into our talk today, uh, it's very, very easy to break them. So our exploration of this topic is motivated by this one key question. Are adversary examples simply a fun toy problem for researchers or they are an example of a deeper and more chronic frailty of our models? So uh, this is the outline we're going to follow. We'll keep coming back to it, but let's start with looking into adversarial attacks first. But even before that, we probably need to build up some background. And uh, I'll quickly go over these slides because some of you, are, hopefully most of you are somewhat familiar with machine learning. So idea behind machine learning is that you have, uh, let's look a very simple classification problem with two classes. And uh, uh, you have uh, basically, what you're trying to do is uh, figure out a deep learning network which can build a sort of a separation boundary between the two classes. And what you do is basically, let's look at a simple feed forward neural network. Uh, you have the input layer on the left side, the outputs on the right, and the hidden layers in the middle. You are trying to figure out or trying to assign weights to uh, the hidden layers. And uh, there's a cost function associated with the problem, which is we are trying to minimize the probability of misclassifying a new test input. Um, what you're trying to do while doing this whole training process is that using backpropagation and essentially using, you're trying to do a gradient descent on the weights of the network. Uh, and essentially what you're trying to get to ultimately is that uh, sort of uh, the model decision boundary, which is the solid line. Uh, and if we try to kind of uh, look back at what uh, we are trying to do with adversarial examples is that we are trying to change the input a little bit so that it gets pushed off the uh, solid line. So if you look at this red circle, it becomes a blue circle. Or if you look at this blue cross, it becomes a red cross. So this is essentially what we're trying to do by constructing adversarial examples. So uh, let's back up for a minute and try to first figure out what do we even mean by security in machine learning. And as, with normally, as is normally true with general information security, uh, we have this model called CIA model of security, which is basically means that to break a machine learning model, an attacker can compromise either its confidentiality, integrity, or availability. So that is the CIA. And together these properties form the CIA model of security. So let's look at confidentiality, which is to provide confidentiality, a machine learning system must not leak information to unauthorized users. So in practice, uh, confidentiality in machine learning makes more sense when we think about it as maybe privacy. That is, the model must not leak sensitive data. Uh, so for example, uh, let's think of like sensitive medical data, uh, patients' medical records, and uh, suppose we use them to build a machine learning model to offer a disease diagnosis. Uh, so publishing such a model could provide a valuable resource to doctors, but it is also important to make sure that a malicious person cannot examine the model and recover private medical data regarding the patients who helped train the model. So this is what we mean by uh, when we say that, hey, uh, confidentiality in our machine learning models is important. Uh, the second one, integrity is the one that we kind of are more concerned with when we think of adversarial examples. So it just means that adversaries are capable of tampering with the model's integrity. 
uh, can alter its prediction to differ from the intended ones. So for instance, spammers may try to design their email messages to be incorrectly recognized as legitimate messages. So it's basically uh, should not be possible for someone to modify input a little bit so that it gets misclassified by the machine learning algorithm. Um, by the way, if you have any questions at any point of time, please feel free to leave them in chat. Uh, uh, one second. Uh, okay, good. Yeah, I was just checking chat. So uh, another one, uh, the third one of the CIA is the accessibility, which is uh, you're trying to say that an attacker should, can also compromise the system's availability, right? So for instance, a self-driving car might be forced to go into a fail-safe mode and pull over if an adversary plays an extremely confusing object next to the road ahead of the car. So there are, uh, so we have to make sure that, so this basically, this these three comprise the CIA model of security. Um, so a secure system is one, uh, one that can be depended upon and it's guaranteed to behave as expected, right? So when we attempt to provide guarantees about how the system will behave, we do so with a particular threat model in mind. Uh, the threat model is a formally defined set of assumptions about the capabilities and goals of any attacker who may wish the system might uh, should be misbehave, right? So let's look at uh, sort of the terminology or the two things that we care most about when we are talking about adversarial attacks. Uh, one is the thing that we call the white box attack. Um, so in white box attacks, the attacker has access to the model's parameters while in black box attacks, uh, the attacker has no access to these parameters. So the idea is that in white box, you have access to both the model's architecture as well as the parameter of each and every layer. And every, like you have full access to the entire model. Whereas uh, uh, in black box, uh, uh, the adversary is only capable of interacting with the model by observing its predictions on chosen inputs. So, uh, all right, so we have uh, questions coming in. That's great. Keep sending them and uh, I'll come back and answer them uh, as and when we, uh, after uh, we leave the last 15 minutes for Q&A. But this is great. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so coming back to it, um, in the black box model, yeah, uh, the attacker has no access to these parameters, but it uses a, a uh, different model or no model at all to generate adversarial images with the hope that these images will transfer to the target model. Um, so, and the other terminology that we want to go up, uh, then we kind of talk about are the non-targeted attacks and targeted attacks. What this means is that if you're looking at a simple classification problem, and if it's a multi-class classification problem, in a non-targeted attack, all we care about is a misclassification to happen. So for instance, if you were looking at like something like an ImageNet data set and uh, we have say a thousand class classification problem, all we care about is that a, a coffee cup should not get classified as coffee cup. It can be get classified as any class other than coffee cup and that's okay with us and that's a non-targeted attack. So the aim of non-targeted attack is to enforce the model is misclassifies the adversarial image. Whereas the targeted attack uh, it, the attacker pretends to get the image classified as a specific target class, which is different from the true class. Um, so uh, let's uh, dive deeper into exactly how these adversarial attack works. Um, again, coming back to this image, we are trying to again see how or exactly what is the mechanism behind nudging a, a red circle to a blue circle or a blue cross to a red cross. And uh, there are few successful or common attacks that we will look at. Um, we will start with the very first basic ones. Uh, so coming back to sort of like an overview of these common attacks, uh, most successful attacks are generally gradient-based methods. 
Uh, what this means is that the attackers modify the image in the direction of the gradient of the loss function with respect to the input image. So uh, when we think about it, it's sort of uh, uh, we'll, uh, sort of like look exactly what this means. Uh, but uh, basically, there are two major approaches to perform such attacks. Uh, there are one-shot attacks in which the attacker takes a single step in the direction of the gradient. And there are iterative attacks where instead of a single step, several steps are taken. So we, the three of the most common attacks uh, uh, we're going to discuss out of these, the first two that we're going to look at are one shot attacks and the last one is an iterative attack. So this one, fast gradient sign methods, um, which sort of almost was one of the initial attacks that came out in 20, around 2014 mm -hmm. was, um, uh, is sort of like the easiest to understand and this is one that we're going to dive in uh, in a little bit more detail so this method basically computes an adversarial image by adding a pixel wide perturbation uh, in the magnitude uh, in the direction of the gradient right so what this means is that this perturbation is computed with a single step and uh, it is very and since it's a single step uh, gradient uh, it's a single step attack it is very efficient in terms of computation time so um, basically what you're trying to do is uh, you're trying to calculate this term in the middle and you're trying to add it to the input image. So if you look at it in the leftmost image, the system correctly classifies that image as 97.3% uh, probability. But after you add a little bit of noise on the right, although the image that we see clearly is looks the same bird towards humans as the leftmost image, the continents start classifying it as a bookcase with an 88.9 percent probability so this is sort of the gist of an adversarial example the image on the rightmost uh, is an adversarial example to our continent or our neural network and uh, this is like the surprising part right like by adding only a little bit of noise uh, with, with sort of like well-constructed targeted noise not white noise we are able to bring a system to believe that that is a bookcase and not a bird anymore so sort of uh, coming back to this uh, sort of the math behind uh, fgsms it's actually kind of easy like if you think about it so the first step is to calculate the gradient of your cost with respect to the input pixels uh, so this can be a bit odd concept at first because in back propagation uh, we typically think of gradients in terms of model parameters Right, like so, if you modify this weight or that one, how much does that change the impact of overall loss? Uh, but the output of a network again is uh, just as much a function of its input pixels as it is a function of its parameters. Right, so we just typically only think about modifying the model parameters and not the input. But you can honestly do the other thing too. Here, you can think that the model parameters are fixed and uh, the input is not fixed because that essentially that is essentially what we are trying to construct in this adversarial example so we are updating the parameters of the input or rather we are updating the input to fit the model and not the other way around um, so yeah so essentially we have an already trained model and we have flipped the problem instead of optimizing the parameters to decrease loss we are holding the images uh, um, decrease loss while holding the images constant. We could we are optimizing the image pixels to increase loss holding the parameters constant. So that is like uh, essentially the in, the whole idea or intuition behind the uh, how to construct adversarial examples. Uh, so once we have taken the gradient of the output with respect to the pixels, we will end up with a pixel matrix or essentially a tensor that corresponds in size to the input image. Uh, and it is essentially filled with values that indicate how much the loss would change if that pixel value were updated by a single unit. Then if GSM basically takes that gradient matrix and takes the sign of it, right? So it is to say that it basically reduces this matrix of floating point values so that it entirely contains either just minus ones for values that were negative or plus ones for values that were positive. And once you have the sign matrix S, uh, you what you do is you the, the method chooses some 
value epsilon, which is an, a model parameter, and multiply the two. So you have a matrix full of just plus epsilon or negative epsilon. And then you add this matrix to the input pixel matrix, and you hopefully have yourself an adversarial example like the one on the right. Um, so the second method that we're going to look at is targeted fast gradient sign method. So this is essentially a targeted version of the FGSM that we just saw. So we are very similar to FGSM, but in this method, a gradient step is computed. Uh, but the direction, but what we do is like, in this case, uh, we compute the gradient in the direction of the, so we just add uh, the negative gradient with respect to the target class, because here you're trying, this is a targeted attack, whereas the previous one was a non-targeted attack. Um, so in a target attack, you are given a class like for hair we, in this FGSM, it, we didn't really care whether this bird gets misclassified as a bookcase or a coffee cup or whatever. However, in TFGSM, we want to misclassify it, uh, misclassify it as a particular target. And hence, it's uh, what we're doing is that we are kind of uh, um, uh, kind of adapting the last attack to make it more targeted. Uh, this is the third one that we want to talk about is again on the same theme, but this is an iterative version of the FGSM. And uh, essentially what we're trying to do is that we are applying FGSM, but doing the step of calculating the gradient multiple times so that we take multiple steps in the direction of worsening the model. So typically when this is done, the total possible distance is capped so that even though you might take multiple steps, your uh, sort of uh, the L infinity or whatever other distance norm you want to use distance from the input doesn't rise above a fixed value. So idea is that your image doesn't uh, mod get modified in, so you want to make sure that your adversarial example still almost looks like the input, uh, uh, maybe that's perceived by humans or as perceived by some other distance metric. Um, so uh, basically what we're trying to get to is that both so the first two are one shot methods where you get to do only one step and the third one is an iterative method where you do multiple steps and both have both the one shot methods have lower success rates uh, in white box of attacks where you have full knowledge of the model parameters however when you look at black box attacks uh, the basic single shot methods turn out to be more effective, more likely because uh, the iterative methods tend to overfit to a particular model. So these three are sort of the sort of textbook cases of algorithms or methods to construct adversarial examples. Um, the, we can uh, look into a couple more, but the uh, sort of uh, the more cutting edge sort of uh, um, methods that have come out in the recent years. Uh, so at NIPS 2017, which as you many of you, you might know is one of the premier data science conferences. So December 2017, which is almost a year and a year and a month ago, uh, they held a very sweet competition on adversarial examples. So idea was that they would have uh, fixed data sets like MNIST or CIFAR or any of these. And uh, uh, researchers were invited to they make both uh, to construct both the attacks and defenses and sort of try to compete against each other with uh, and so on. So this one uh, called boosting adversarial attacks with momentum uh, and uh, basically was the winning attack in both non-targeted and targeted adversarial attacks competitions. And uh, there's a lot of math here, but essentially what it boils down to is that this method makes use of momentum to improve the performance of the iterative gradient methods and um, have a put up slides or link them somewhere so you can actually dive deeper into this if you want to um, the results show that uh, one second so i have a notification coming in from you guys let me just quickly look at the questions if there are any Uh, all right, so I'm going to be checking your questions and uh, the chat. Right. Uh, the question is on the Q&A box. 
Oh, awesome. All right. Yeah. All right. So I could see the Q&A tree. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's quickly. So I think it's a good point to take a couple questions and then we'll just continue with the slides. So I'm just very quickly looking at uh, Ryan's first question or the latest question that came. Uh, I think you can keep going the slides and then uh, answer the questions in the end. Okay, okay. If that's if that works better, that's good with me as well. Awesome. Okay, so let's miss this. Let's miss this. All right. So uh, again, so yeah. So the results show that this method outperforms all other methods in the competition and shows good transfer transferability results. What that basically means is that it performs well in black box attacks, as seen in this figure. Um, so there are two more attacks that I want to quickly touch upon, uh, which are sort of have become state of the art since, or basically have been around for a while, but uh, sort of have the more interesting ones. Uh, deep fool is an attack which kind of iteratively linearizes the loss function at an input point. So it does that by taking tangent to the loss function at that point, and it applies the minimal perturbation that would be necessary to switch classes if that linear approximation were correct, right? So it performs this procedure multiple times, and each time it uses as input the prior input and the prior perturbation until the network's chosen class switches, right? So because that's your objective that we are trying to create an adversarial example. Um, the next one that I want to touch upon is Carlini's attack. These are researchers from Berkeley, which came up with an attack which directly optimizes for having the minimal distance from the original example under the constraint of having the example be misclassified by the original model, right? So this is the more costly attack since it involves solving a non-trivial optimization problem. Um, however, it is very effective and uh, it is very effective against defenses that uh, block earlier varieties of adversarial examples. And uh, I mean, as best as I can tell, it is the current heavyweight champion of attacks, which is normally used for sort of all the uh, sort of coming to a common baseline when you're trying to discuss defenses and stuff. So everybody tries to defend their models against Carlini Wegner's attacks. Um, let's uh, go to a lighter side of things and let's actually look at some examples and demos because this has been probably a little bit of heavy dosage of math or whatever but uh, the best part about this field is that the demos and uh, the examples that we come up with are kind of quite surprising you might have seen that in the macabre case uh, that was just one of them, but essentially this is the paper that came out, I think in 2013, uh, which sort of almost started this field. Uh, uh, basically one of the sort of, uh, they, what they do is like, they showed all these examples where they were kind of constructing targeted attacks. So they take a correctly classified image, which is the left image in all these columns. They add a little bit of noise or distortion, which is in the middle and they fool the columnets with the resulting right image. So all the resulting right image, right, the, the rightmost columns in both these, uh, uh, in all these sets are the images which are all classified as ostriches. But to a human like us, obviously these are not ostriches, they're obviously a school bus or a dog or a bird or however it may be, right? So this was one of the, things that almost kicked off the field and it was kind of surprising at the moment. And um, the same uh, people or rather some part of the similar team followed up with this paper, which kind of started helped us start building intuition about these uh, problems. And uh, this is one very famous image, sort of like they kind of, this is where there's a paper where they propose FGSM, which is essentially a very quick, easy way to, a sort of a way to quickly create uh, an adversarial example. And um, the third paper that I really like, again, by the same people, uh, Ian Fellow and um, other people at the Google Brain team at that point, was uh, this paper called Adversarial Examples in the Physical World. And uh, the interesting part about these examples was that they showed that these examples, after they have been generated, can be printed out on a piece of paper and photographed with a standard resolution smartphone. And it will still cause uh, classifier to fail. So, for instance, in this, they classify they 
uh, try to create an adversarial example of a standard washer and they try to get it classified as a uh, safe and as you can see the b is a clean image which gets classified as a washer by a standard uh, app uh, which we will link to in the end uh, which lets you run basic uh, neural nets which are still like sort of uh, uh, Kind of very recent, but try to kind of classify them into one of a thousand classes, and they classify it classifies it as a washer. But you print an adversarial example, it gets classified as a safe, which is uh, sort of uh, more surprising in the sense that these are transferable not beyond just the actual input data being fed, but they are transferable after a bunch of affine transformations, printing defects, lighting differences, and so on and so forth. Um, this is one of my favorite sort of examples. This is definitely not state of the art, but it got published in 2017, I believe. Uh, and it was called the adversarial patch. And what these people showed is that it's possible to print out stickers, which when sort of put next to another object uh, with minimal sort of uh, surface area, they can make a system misclassify what it is. This is best shown with this demo video, which I'll hope place so as you can see this input is getting classified as a banana in the start you put a sticker of a toaster it still is banana the system can make out that you were just trying to put a sticker however if you put a weird psychedelic sticker whatever which is very carefully constructed for attacking this network um, it gets classified as a toaster so this image gets classified as the toaster and not a banana whereas this is clearly a banana this is still a banana it recognizes that that is just a sticker and it's not does not change its output however this completely attacks the system and makes it get classified as a ben as a toaster so this sort of uh, concluded a lot of interesting or sort of brought the field or made this feel a lot more mainstream because people suddenly realize that these adversarial attacks can have real implica implications in the world for instance you could probably fool a self-driving car to believe that what is in front of it uh, is not a stop sign but a yield sign and sort of like in areas that are not well mapped or do not have sort of a uh, good uh, street maps or good rules encoded in them we won't be able to rely on just um, the image recognition capabilities of the cars to uh, to sort of make these decisions uh, if you guys want you can scan this qr code or go to that uh, url at the bottom uh, it's basically a very small third party app made by a few researchers called Demitasse, and uh, what it does is essentially you will be able to play with this demo on this app so you can actually print out the sticker place it on table and this app gives you these probabilities and everything and if you want you can download any of the data sets uh, which is again one of the things that we see that uh, these attacks are highly transferable across various models so you can download this very particular bgg cnnf uh, model data but you can pretty much download any model data and the attack still works so i hope you have this down if you if you want to look at it later but uh it's basically bit.ly slash image dash record um so again coming back to the things that you're talking about like what are the implications of these attacks and uh, the first one that i already mentioned was a uh, patch may make a car thing that a stop sign is a yield sign and things of that sort so that is a very interesting application the second one again in the sort of realm of image recognition or um, is uh, so not in, so the second one is like sort of not based in image recognition itself but you can think of things like radio broadcasts and you can sort of hide uh, malicious instructions to alexa or other voice based assistants so that they can sort of end up uh, doing things that you do not want them to do so this and but to a human they just sound like news like or a news uh, sort of a news reader just talking out loud um third one a little more malicious is sort of uh, you can sell banned substances on sites like ebay because their automatic detection systems will try to sort of figure out what it is uh, but uh, like to a normal person it will be a banned substance but to the algorithm it might think oh it's just a toaster or something like that so overall we have seen that there are a few remarkable factors about these adversarial examples uh 
the things that I sort of really want to talk about in this one is that there are two surprising things. One is the amount of noise we add is almost imperceivable. And uh, second is uh, sort of the, with a very small amount of noise, you are able to achieve very high confidence. Like we have seen that the system misclassifies not with a 55% confidence, but with a 99.7% confidence. So we can't even do like a cutoff thing that, hey, if the confidence is below 90%, just output that we are not sure. That's not true. We are able to get a system to misclassify objects with a very, very high confidence. So uh, this particular element makes these adversary examples uh, sort of like very interesting. Generally, a characteristic of well-trained models is that they're relatively invariant to small amounts of noise, right? So when we add random noise, this is in fact generally the case. Experiments have typically confirmed that adding true white noise to an image typically doesn't impact the performance of well-performing models. But when it comes to non-random noise, uh, which is basically the noise that we are adding, which is engineered to fool the network, a surprisingly small amount of such noise is enough to it's it's enough to meaningfully shift the network's going on into output. And this noise is completely imperceivable by a human eye, but our current combination con nets and uh, other technologies we use to uh, classify images completely come and fall down. The third thing that we want to talk about is the transferability, which is basically what the, the attack that is constructed using a particular net, which is like in, in a white box attack setting, it doesn't really, the, the attack, the adversarial example is highly transferable to other nets as well. And uh, there's a little bit to be said about the intuition behind transferability. And uh, it's basically to explain why multiple classifiers assign the same class to adversarial examples. Uh, we basically hypothesize that neural networks trained with current method methodologies all resemble the linear classifier learned on the same training set. So basically this reference classifier is able to learn approximately the same classification rates when trained in different subsets of the training set. And simply because of that, uh, machine learning algorithms are able to generalize. And uh, essentially this generalization extends itself to adversarial examples as well. So coming back to our outline, let's quickly dive into the proposed defenses against these attacks so far. Um, the first one we'll cover, we we'll cover only a couple. The first one is adversarial training. And it is basically a brute force solution where we simply generate a lot of adversarial examples and use them as part of a training data set. And we explicitly train the model not to be fooled by each of them. So it seeks to improve the generalization of a model when presented with adversarial examples uh, at test time. And uh, it does this by proactively generating adversarial examples beforehand as part of the training procedure. So in general, my comments about this is that um, it to provide, it, we haven't seen it provide uh, a meaningful level of robustness on other attacks. And basically it makes the approach a bit of a game of whack-a-mole, right? Like, um, once you can use these um, adversary examples that you have constructed to sort of uh, um, use them as part of your training set to make sure your network is robust to them, but there are other techniques or there are other uh, attacks that are sort of more involved that you might have forgotten to or you might not have taken into account. So it just becomes a game of whack a mole and uh, it, is ha it has not been very effective overall. Uh, the second one is defensive distillation, and it's a technique which basically learns a secondary model to mimic what a primary model has learned. And, uh, but, and it does that by training on the primary model's uh, soft output. So what it's trying to do is, rather than hard labels, like a zero-one label or a true-false label, we are trying to, we try to uh, sort of train a secondary model in a way uh, so that it pushes it to produce a more even distribution over outwards rather than one very confident value and many other very small ones. So basically, it creates a model whose surface is smooth in the direction of an, an, an adversary will typically try to exploit, making it difficult for them to discover adversarial input tweaks that lead to incorrect categorization. So this bias towards softer outputs was shown to have some success depending, uh, defending initial variants of adversarial attacks, but again, has been beaten by more recent ones like the cardini Wagner attack we looked at earlier. Um, I think lastly, uh, we'll conclude with sort of 
going a little bit on the intuition behind like the cellular tags. So like we started in the very start with the motivation that are these just simply a fun toy problem for researchers or do they kind of bring out a deeper and more chronic frailty in our models? And uh, ultimately, the most of the machine learning community has sort of, or rather the current researcher consensus is that grocery examples aren't a product of overfitting. They are, uh, but they are rather an out, they are, they are a result of high dimensional input and the internal linearity of our modern models. Um, so what we mean by this is that linear models extrapolate and their behavior is quite pathological outside of the region where training data is concentrated, right? So what's usually happening is that uh, we are talking about very high dimensional spaces where our training data lies in a small area in that high dimensional space. And our models, it's sort of like performs well close to that area, which is known as manifold in uh, ML terminology. But as soon as you go up, away from the manifold of where the, the training data is concentrated, the machine learning model can perform anywhere and, and it can go either way. So this extrapolation is basically caused by the fact that uh, by the definition of what makes a linear model linear, each feature has the same partial slope right uh, regardless of its value or the value of other features so uh basically if you manage to push your input away uh from the training data region in a direction exactly aligned with the decision boundary you can reach a part of the decision space that the model is quite certain corresponds to a different category but it's completely wrong about it um essentially what you're looking at over here is that in a high dimensional space you have data concentrated very close to the, the areas where data is concentrated, you will have good performance, but uh, each individual pixel basically might only uh, increase by a very small amount, but have those differences contribute to a dramatic difference in the weights it multiplied by the input dot product. And since all of those small differences are multiplied by weights and then summed together, even with a minor perturbation, you can end up completely elsewhere in your high dimensional space. So, Essentially, uh, this is like the sort of uh, thing that we are going after. And um, again, like if you think about it, uh, it at first glance, it sounds very weird to think about, okay, um, this seems very weird that deep networks are, they are nonlinear by definition, right? If deep networks didn't have nonlinear activation functions, they'd be no more complex than a single la layer linear function, right? And we would have no hope of learning the functions they in fact learn. So while it is correct that deep networks need to be nonlinear in order to work, within the space possible of nonlinear activation functions, if we if you are familiar with general deep learning concepts, you would know that modern deep nets have actually settled on burn that is very close to linear, which is the rectifier linear unit, which we see over here. So idea is that it's linear on the positive x and just flattens out to zero. So technically it's a non-linear unit, but it is linear for everything more than zero on the X, right? Um, and even rectify a uh, linear unit, yes, does qual qualify as non-linearity, uh, but compared to uh, sigmoid or damage activations, which simply saturate to a cap value at high activation, it's possible to push the rectify a linear unit to arbitrary high values using the logic outlined in the earlier section over here. And uh, basically, overall, the interesting thing that we see is that the choice of activation is the trade-off between the tra trainability of the models and their robustness to aggressive attacks. So an easier a model is to train, the less robust it becomes to adversarial attacks. And this is the key reason why uh, sort of uh, we have ended up in a situation where we keep running into adversarial attacks that are highly transferable and um, sort of hard to defend against. Um, so if you look at the uh, tan edge or the logistic functions, um, they were difficult to train in because those regions uh, are near the tails where the slope of the activation is uh, kind of almost gets to zero, the network gets stuck, which is why we switched to the rectifying linear units because uh, they sort of uh, do not get stuck uh, with, because they have a non-zero gradient everywhere to the right of zero. So the uh, rectified lean, leaning units turn out to be a lot more stabler and easier to train with. So, there, so that's the sort of conclusion of over here is that uh, 
sort of a beneficial effect of high trainability using the, uh, uh, the rectifier is that uh, it makes them less defendable against adversarial attacks. Uh, this is uh, so Ian Goodfellow, the researcher who has sort of been leading this field. This is sort of a direct quote from one of his papers, and uh, it basically says that ease of optimization has come at the cost of models that are easily misled. And uh, this is something that the machine learning community in general needs to think more about. Uh, I would basically conclude by looking at uh, sort of where does the field go from here. And ultimately, there are three things over here. Uh, first, we would like our models to be able to fail gracefully when used in production, right? Uh, even if the model inputs are pushed to an area of the manifold which the network has not seen before, we want them. We want the network to be able to output that hey, uh, this point or this adversarial example is or this example or this input is probably adversarial, and I do not know where to classify it. So that is the sort of uh, thing that we are settling on. Uh, essentially, we would want to push our models to exhibit uh, to exhibit the low confidence when they are operating out of distribution, and ultimately, the real problem here. Uh, that adversarial examples has, uh, or this HMP has brought out, is that models exhibiting sort of unpredictable and overly confident performance outside of the training distribution uh, is sort of a real uh, problem out here. And basically, adversarial examples are just an imperfect proxy to this bigger problem that we have seen. Awesome, awesome. So this is pretty much it. Uh, the conclusion that I want you to walk away from from most of this is that there are these interesting that that is very easy to fool modern machine learning system, or has been pretty much easy to fool modern machine learning system ever since uh, the field sort of got reinvigorated back in 2012, 2013. And going forward, these uh, attacks can have huge implications. 